This is probably the last lecture of the last day of the last, uh, whatever, Friday afternoon. Um, this is very free flowing and I'm happy to change and talk about some other things. Um, but there are a couple topics I wanted to, to cover so at least you have a passing familiarity with them. Um, I'm going to try to tie them all together. Start with this idea <clears throat> that I think is the central idea of machine learning that uh, machine learning can very often be thought of as optimization of two components. One of them is how well your theory fits the data and the other one is how simple your theory is. Remember that? Going back. So we'll call that <clears throat> goodness of fit. How will your theory, um, which I will designate here with some parameters theta, so this is all the parameters of your model, it fits the data, which I'll call D. And how simple is your theory? Um, or actually, how complex is your theory? No, goodness of fit, uh, but lower, higher is better, so simplicity. And we somehow combine them and try to minimize or maximize over theta, something like this. We're looking for a theta instead of parameters, or could even be a structure of a tree or a structure of a network that explains the data, but is fairly simple. And we eventually will have an objective measure of which is the best, namely which, whichever does best on held out data. <clears throat> I'm going to um, give you an equivalent formulation, which is argmin. Instead of looking at something that gets better as it goes higher, I look at something that gets better as it goes lower, and I call it loss, a loss function. It's the same thing with the negative sign in front of it, kind of. Slight difference is that um, loss often is bounded by zero. Although it doesn't have to be. There are some loss functions that could be arbitrarily low. So I'm having loss here on this side. The opposite of simplicity is complexity, right? And now I can make different choices in the different areas, and I'll mention some of the choices we discussed. The most common choice here, at least the one that we discussed the most, is L2, sum of squared errors of some sort. And we said that one of the reasons it's used so often is because it's very easy to work with, it's very easy to minimize, uh, the derivative is linear, you can find a, the minimum or the maximum, we want minimum. Um, but a deeper reason is that it corresponds to an underlying assumption that whatever deviation remained between your model and reality is due to Gaussian noise. Put another way, if your model was the correct model of reality, and but reality also had an added Gaussian noise to it, then um, the log of the error between your pred prediction and truth um, would be captured by the squared sum of squares. Um, but there are other things we can use here. For example, you can use the negative log likelihood. I'll write it in uppercase, because I can't write in cursive. Negative log likelihood. Likelihood is a function of data and parameters. So log likelihood is also a function of data and parameters. And we need negative because we want lower to be better. Um, this is particularly appropriate when what we're trying to predict or to model or to estimate are themselves probabilities as opposed to something else, something that has a wide range, 
not just from zero to one. So um, logistic regression uses effectively the log likelihood lo or the negative log likelihood loss function. Negative log likelihood loss function is is uh, referred to colloquially as log loss. Call it log loss. This is L2 loss or squared loss. What are the units of uh, the log loss? Can you guess or figure out in what units is log loss measured? Centimeters? Second squared? Gram? Sorry? What are the units of log loss? It's not probability, it's related to probability. What, how is it related to probability? It's a log probability. What are the units of log probability? It's yes, it's bits. Information theory. You should move back between all of these. So remember, this is expressed in bits. What are the units of this? Well, it's the square of whatever the unit is that you're predicting. If you're predicting kilograms of tomatoes being shipped, then it's squared kilograms. All right, another famous and important uh, loss function is called zero one loss. Or zero slash one loss. And it is exactly what it means. It has only two values, zero or one. One is the bad value, it means you made an error. So zero one lo a loss function means counting how many errors you made. So that's appropriate for a classification, where what you care about is percent error or percent of uh, a fraction of errors. So this would be zero or one. Well, let me write it a slightly different way. I'll write it like this. This is the loss. It's clearly either one or zero, right? And it switches around the point. So if you're, you're gonna make your final decision based on some continuous thing like um, whether you're on one side of a separating plane or on the other side or a, a perceptron or something like that, if you move your output, your loss jumps from zero to one or from one to zero. So it's an abrupt jump. It has a lot of problems. It's very hard to optimize over it because it's not uh, uh, differentiable. It's not even continuous. So it's very hard computationally, but it captures sometimes what we want, which is to minimize the number of errors we make. Now, if we think about um, the computational aspects of this, of this search, Clearly, it's a search in a huge space, so we need to hope or look for situations where we can find the optimum. The best situation is if this thing is convex. If it is convex, then there are many ways of finding the minimum. Um, if it's not convex, we might still be looking for, and in fact, there's even better than convex, if there's an analytical solution. If you can solve it analytically and in one, equation or in one formula know the answer, that's fantastic. And that's the case for linear regression, for example, uh, at least for this part of linear regression, which is done, I'm sorry, linear regression, ordinary linear regression, which is done with L2. You can do just matrix multiplication and we, we worked out the complexity of it. But in, in general, when you look at the loss functions, one, one of the uh, uh, practical considerations, maybe the most important one is um, can I solve it analytically? If not, can I at least solve it iteratively if it's convex? If not, can I solve it heuristically iteratively? Uh, if there are multiple local minima, can I at least get to one of them like with EM? Um, or if it has other properties, like if it's a submodular function, then I have um, a better chance of, of finding a reasonable solution. 
you need to ask that question here, and you need to ask the question here. For you to be able to find the global minimum, you need to be able to find, typically, you need to be able to find the global minimum here and the global minimum here. They both need to be easy to work with. There might be some crazy cases, maybe when neither one is easy to work with, but there some is, I don't know, I'm sure you can come up with something. But in general, you need both of them to be reasonable to work with. Let me suggest another different loss function here, and I'll suggest it with a picture and compare it to this picture. Imagine this loss function. Here you're at zero like this one, but you stop here and you start going up. This is the boundary of, that you want to cross, the same as here, to get the right answer. And the idea is that when you're on the wrong side of the boundary, here you're just paying a fixed price, and then once you manage to find the boundary and cross it, you're not paying a price anymore. This is helping you because it tells you in which direction to go to get to the right place. And once you get to the right place, it pushes you a little bit away from it, and then it doesn't care anymore. So this is designed to help you with classification, getting to the right side of the, of the boundary. But um, unlike this case, it doesn't leave you as soon as you cross the boundary. It pushes you a little bit away. So it's very good if there's noise in the measurements. You want to be a little bit you know, careful and push the answer a little away from the decision boundary. Once you push a little bit away, you don't care how far away you are. Do you know what this kind of loss function is called? It looks like a hinge of a door. Right? It's like, like this is a door that can move. So it's called hinge loss. And hinge loss Hinge loss, for the reason I just explained, is strongly associated with something we call max margin classifiers. A max margin classifier is a classifier that would put a separating line here such that the distance from the line to the point, to these points, is maximized. The distance from all the points to the separating line is maximized. If I didn't impose the max margin constraint, there are many lines that would separate all of these. For example, this line, and this line, and this line, there are infinitely many lines. I have a lot of wiggle room. A max margin classifier has the property that it um, chooses in that wiggle room the line that is maximally apart from all the others, and it usually it does that by using this kind of hinge loss. Now, a fixed hinge loss that has a hinge at a particular place means that it will try to push the points up to that point but not beyond it. But you can modify the location of the hinge to, to make it maximal, so it's the, it's the dual formulation of that problem. Um, Max margin classifiers, the most famous one is called SVM, support vector machine. Um, SVM is effectively a hinge loss plus an L2 regularizer. So this is called the regularizer, aka Regularizer or regularization. Uh, the re we use the term regular or regularized to mean simplified, smoothed. Maybe a better term would be a simplifier. Uh, so it's L2 regularizer. And the, the idea behind SVM is that there may be lots of other positives here and lots of other negatives here, far away from the separating line. They don't make any difference to the answer. As long as they're on the right side, the correct side of the divide, they don't affect the answer at all. What affects the answer are only the frontier, 
only the points that are near the boundary because they determine where the maximum margin line is. And these points are called the support vectors. Uh, not a very good name in my opinion, but whoever came up with it had the right to name them, so um, that was um, Vapnik. And why is it a machine? I don't know. But I find it easier to remember and understand these things if you just map them into the right place. This is a classifier that works by minimizing the sum of a hinge loss plus an L2 regularizer. So this is SVM and this is max margin. Let's talk a little bit about regularization. We already talked about uh, L2 regularizer. This is simply the sum of the squared theta i's, right? That's the L2 norm, or the, actually the squared L2 norm of the vector of parameters. Uh, this was probably the very first regularizer that was used, and when it's used in standard regression, it's called uh, ridge regression. Then, only about 20 years ago, um, Tib Shirani, not our Tib Shirani, but his father, um, came up with this regularizer. It's called an L1 regularizer. Called it Lasso. Um, this regularizer has the advantage that it results in sparser solutions, solutions that have fewer non-zero elements. So it pushes the solution towards relying on a small number of covariates, the rest of them being zero, a small number, of, the rest of the betas being zero. The L2 regularizer doesn't do that. The L2 regularizer pushes all the betas towards zero. So it ends up with solutions that have lots of non-zero betas, but they're very small. The beta values are very small. The L1 regularizer creates more compact solutions, dependence on fewer variables. If you go all the way to L0, this would be actually the number of non-zero thetas. Those are the same as betas, right? Beta is what we use in regression, but theta is more general. Um, so the L0 regularizer pushes even strongly, even more strongly than the L1 regularizer towards reliance on fewer covariates. Very often in the real world, that's what you want. Or that's what you believe is the right answer. You believe that you have 50 covariates because somebody gave you a spreadsheet with 50 columns, but you don't believe they all belong, they're all re really relevant. You really think it only de depends on two or three of them. So if you want to bring in that belief, the L0 regularizer is your, your regularizer of choice. The problem is that it's not a convex function. So it's very hard to fully op optimize to find the true minimum of an L0 regularizer, whereas L1 and up is easy. I think all of that I told you. I want to tell you of another, but another regularizer. Um, call it log prior on theta. Negative log prior. This is not a negative, this is an underscore. What this is, is saying, suppose there was some prior distribution over the thetas. So some, some configurations, some parameter uh, values, I think are more likely than others. I want to prefer the ones that I think are more likely. So those that have a higher prior value also have a higher log, -like, log prior value and therefore lower negative log. I'm sure you noticed by now the similarity between this and this. What are the units of this? Bits. So let's write it down here. Argmin 
over theta of the negative log likelihood, log likelihood of data given theta plus negative log of the prior over theta. Sometimes I put a bar, sometimes I don't. I'm kind of loosey-goosey. Well, let's turn it into an augmax and get rid of that pesky negative sign. It's augmax of log likelihood to data given theta plus log prior over theta. Well, let's get rid of the log, of the pesky log. This is the same as argmax of the log likelihood of data given theta times the prior over theta. Yeah? Why is theta given theta not theta? Shouldn't it be theta given theta? So you have theta and then you're checking like a new. You're, you're right ahead of me. Likelihood is, the likelihood function is defined as the probability of the data conditioned on theta. If you go back to the definition of the, you know, maximum likelihood estimate, uh, of the likelihood function, period. But you're on to something. What can I do with this product? Product of the likelihood and prior should look familiar to you. Sorry? Yes, yes, this is proportional to the posterior probability of uh, theta given data. I'm saying proportional, it's not the same because they're related through the probability of the data, but probability of the data is constant because it doesn't depend on theta. So this is the same as argmax over theta of this thing which is known as theta map. So if you choose as your loss function log loss, which is often a very appropriate choice, especially when you model probabilities, and if you choose as your regularizer the log prior, which is again a very appropriate choice if you have some probabilistic notion of which values are more likely than others some kind of a distribution, prior distribution of your belief over the solution space, then the grand minimization that most of machine learning is boils down to finding the map, the maximum posterior. You don't have to, you can mix and match like SVM does. Well, SVM, yeah, it, it mixes hinge loss with L2 regularization. But here's an interesting thing. You can take these or any other regularizer and treat it as if it were a log prior loss. You can ask yourself, what prior does it correspond to such that the negative log prior looks like this? So if my, if my regularizer was um, the sum of sigma i squared, What prior, when you take its negative log, gives you this? Think of all the probabilities you're familiar with. Louder? Louder, please. Yes, it's a Gaussian prior. If the prior over your theta parameters was um, e to the negative theta squared. I'm writing it now in vector notation, some of this. Then the log of this is this. Take the negative, you get this. So the L2 regularizer can be alternatively thought of as a Gaussian prior over the parameters. 
If it's a Gaussian prior, it doesn't have to sit on the origin, namely on zero, and to have a diagonal unit variance, right? If you have reason to think, to have some other notion in mind, if you want to translate the Gaussian somewhere else, that becomes um, this minus um, center. So this is a vector of the center of the Gaussian. And this is the distance between the actual Gaussian you're minimizing and this. Um, and you would square it. And then you can divide it by either any standard deviation you want or by a whole, you know, sigma one. So you can, you can multiply it by a covariance matrix. In other words, you have much more richness in choosing your prior, but the simplest L2 regularizer is the equivalent of a Gaussian prior, of a unit Gaussian prior, a Gaussian that sits at zero and has unit covariance. Question? Yes, yes. Do you know what it is for this one? It's e to the negative sum of, um, I'm sorry, sum is inside, sum of the sigmas. This is a, a Laplacian prior. So this is a Gaussian prior, this is a Laplacian prior. I don't know what this is, if there is a, a known probability function that corresponds to that. There's one other thing that fits into this picture, and that is, in comes the informatist and or the computer scientist and wants to talk in terms of coding, coding length. So I want to bring in notions of entropy and description length, how many bits we take to describe things. Uh, the computer scientist would say, uh, let's try to find parameters such that um, we can convey a large amount of data, a large, uh, uh, we could convey the behavior of a function on a large amount of data in two steps. First, we transmit the function itself, that means transmit its parameters, and then we assume that the person on the other side has all the inputs. They just apply the function to the inputs, we just have to send them the corrections. So in that way of thinking, let me write it on the next board below it. Here's the loss and here's the regularizer. You prepare the parameters. You send them over here. So this is the cost of transmitting the parameters literally the number of bits it takes to transmit the parameters. And here is cost of transmitting corrections. To the function expressed by these parameters. So let me give you a very simple example. Suppose you believe that the, the function that represents the data well is a tree, a binary decision tree. It doesn't fit the data perfectly, but it fits it very, very well. You have the data, your friend that's very far away has the data, except they don't have the labels. You want to transmit the labels to them. You figured out that the tree is a very good representation, and it's a very large amount of data, so you don't want to transmit all the labels of all the data. You have a, a more efficient way of doing it. First, you transmit the tree, just the description of the tree. That's kind of our parameters. And then you tell your friend, just apply the tree to all the training examples, and you'll get the outputs. And the outputs are going to be right almost always. Let me tell you in which positions it's not right. And because it's a binary output, if I just give you the position, you just flip it from 1 to 0, from 0 to 1. So there would be one example of how 
a body of data is compressed by this representation, and first you send the rule of compression, or the rule of, of, of how to derive it, and then you send the corrections to the rule. The corrections to the rule is the loss. The rule is the simplicity. So you try to look for a rule that's on one hand simple, and on the other hand doesn't have too many corrections. Here's another example. Let's say the output is continuous. In that case, you can't transmit it exactly, but you can assume that the, the, the correction is Gaussian. And therefore, the log likelihood of the Gaussian is going to be a measure of how much correction there is. So, this is expressed in number of bits. Cost is number of bits. And cost here is also number of bits. And people have actually done that for a variety of problems. They've designed things like decision trees or polynomials or something else that could be expressed with a, a description in bits, converted into bits, counted how many bits are needed to describe it. The number of bits is usually linear in the number of parameters. So it's like a fixed number of bits per parameter or per node or something like that. That's the cost here. And then to that, they added the cost of correcting the mistake. When you do it that way, that's an argbin again, what you're minimizing is the length of the total description of the data. And therefore, it's called the minimum, minimum description length. principle or the minimum description length solution, MDL solution. So that would be theta MDL equals this. The MDL solution is the one that minimizes this. Now, if you try to think theoretically, the lowest, the most efficient code to describe this is the Shannon code. Remember Shannon's theory that said that, you know, if you have a certain entropy that the, there is isn't a, 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 a most efficient code, it exists, and its efficiency is exactly equal to the entropy of the source. This is this, or actually to be more exact, this. You can think of the most efficient code if you have some prior in mind about the different theta values, then the most efficient code you can, uh, you can design is the one that assigns negative log prior of theta bits to every possible theta set. So if you take the minimum description length principle and you implement it optimally, theoretically optimally, the coding scheme for this becomes this. And not surprisingly, the optimal coding scheme for this becomes this. So computer scientists came up with MDL, I don't know, 30 years ago and used it for a variety of things. And it took them a while, it took somebody else a while to learn about it and to bring it into base thinking and to say, you guys are just implementing MAP. Let me take, go and go over it a little bit, but at least you're exposed to these ideas. MDL, MAP, all of, all of machine learning is one big MAP, <laughs> right? I wouldn't say all, but a very large part of it. All right, let me switch to something a little different. Some terms that I didn't have a chance to mention in class. Um, I 
If you have two classes and you're trying to distinguish between them, they don't have to be Gaussian, but let's suppose they were. So there are two different objects, and one of them is drawn, you don't know which one, and it generates a real number, a measurement. And suppose you know that they are Gaussians. And suppose you even know exactly what the mean and standard deviation of the Gaussians are, so you can draw them. Now this is the one that generates object, uh, object type A, this is object type B. So you're given a number and you have to guess, did it come from A or did it come from B? Just like the mixture of Gaussians that we discussed. But I want to point to something different. We talked about estimating where the means of the Gaussians are. I'm not interested in estimating. I'm assuming that you know the truth exactly. Somebody told you both Gaussians. You know it exactly, it's not an estimate. Now I'm giving you a real number that came from one of these. And I'm even telling you what the prior is. It's 50-50, it's a fair coin, choosing between A and B. Suppose the number was here. And I'm asking you, which one did it come from? You would tell me most likely it came from B, right? If it were here, you would not be sure. In fact, you can calculate the posteriors. You can calculate a 50-50 here. And in fact, here it would be the posterior ratio would be the ratio between this, col this and this. So if I force you to give me an answer on this point, you will say A is the answer. Will you be correct? Sometimes you'll be correct, sometimes you won't. In fact, we know exactly what fraction of the time you will not be correct. The point I'm trying to make is even when you know the state of the world perfectly, there is still an amount of error that is inescapable. It has to do with the inherent overlap between the classes. That error is called the Bayes error. Is it a good name? Is it a bad name? I don't know. Um, it's based on the assumption that you know the prior and you know the likelihood and therefore you can compute the posterior and you give the answer that has the highest posterior but still sometimes you're wrong. What I wanted you to know is the term Bayes error. Bayes' error is an irreducible an irreducible kind of error that not, nobody in the world can overcome. Now, in the real world, we don't really know the prior and the likelihood. We may not know their shape, maybe they're not exactly Gaussian, or maybe they are Gaussian, but we don't know exactly what the mean and standard deviations and priors and all that. So in the real world, we will be estimating it from some data, either from fully labeled data or from partially labeled data with EM. And our estimates are not going to be exactly right. As a result, our error is going to be greater than the base error. But we can at least in theory break our total error into the part that's a base error that's irreducible and the part that's due to our misrepresenting reality. Does that sound familiar from previous lectures? Which lectures? Information theory again, right? This is an analog, so our models error. Model, models error can be broken down by someone who knows the truth into the base error. plus the modeling error. Now this can be confusing terminology. I just made it up now. This is why I call this models error. Modeling error means error due to the fact that our model differs from reality. Okay? Imperfection error. Imperfection in the model error. Est uh, esti uh, estimation error. Um, Our bed. How's that? This looks like a good technical term. <laughs> What's the analog here in information theory? This is the entropy of a source, right? And this is the KL distance 
I'm sorry, this is the entropy, so I should write it as H of the true, H of P truth. How did I write? Um, try to use the same terminology. Did I write P truth? And this is the KL distance between P truth and P, P model, the model. Right? And the KL distance itself was the difference between the cross entropy and the entropy. So when you add these together, you get the cross entropy from P truth to P model. Question? Um, no. So we always measure the distance from the point of view of the truth. Because when you think about cross entropy, the way we estimate it in real data is by average log surprise, right? And it's average by sampling from the truth and estimating with the model. We don't have, we can sample from the model, but we cannot estimate, we don't know the truth. So just like in the case of information theory, uh, it's a useful thing to know and to think about, but it doesn't give us a recipe for knowing where the limit is, where Bayes' error is. So in information theory, we don't know how for real world phenomena, for, for, for real things, not for things that were invented by the professor. Uh, for real world phenomena, we don't know what the true entropy is. So as we improve our model, we get lower and lower cross entropy, but we don't know when to stop. We don't know when it's futile, when it can't, you can't go any further because you've, you're, you're perfectly modeling reality. It's the same thing here. When you look at a classifier and you try to minimize its error, keep in mind that there is some error that is inescapable. That is the base error. You may or may not be able to estimate how much it is, so you may not know whether you are close to it or not. So you could work for years and try to reduce something with no theoretical chance if, the, if you are at the base error question. So, you just said that base error is something which we cannot reduce. Does that mean that if a model is ever received, I mean, the classification rate is like 100%, the accuracy is like 100%, does that mean in that scenario, we kind of reach the new model in a, in a, in a general world scenario? If any classifier is giving 100% accuracy, there are situations where the model is actually estimating the right problem. Are you asking if it's possible that the base error is zero? Absolutely it's possible. That would mean that the classes are fully separable, are truly separable. Namely that by looking at uh, the input, you could tell with certainty which class it belongs to. That it should be, yeah, yeah, that's entirely possible. Not with Gaussians because they have infinite support. Right, they go on forever. Um, but in other situations, sure. And this is not specific to Gaussians, right? You can have multinomials. Um, give me an example from speech recognition. In speech recognition, um, we rely on the properties of, of language to help with the recognition. Very often, the acoustics, the sound, is not enough. It's somewhat ambiguous. So we rely on the fact that some words that sound similar, um, one of them might be a lot more common than the other. So let's take the word table and the word cable. Table is a much more common word. So if you heard something and there was noise in the sound and you weren't sure if you heard table or cable or if your model wasn't sure, if, it's, if the fit, the acoustic fit is as good for both, you might choose to go with table depending of course on the context, but if you don't have the context to rely on, you might prefer to go with table and it will be right most of the time, but not always. Right? That's another example of Bayes' error. You might get a right, the model, it's not a modeling error. Oh, speaking of which, I should add another kind of error. There's Bayes' error, there's modeling error, and there's another kind of error that is often present for practical reasons, and it's search error. Search error is where you get when that argmin cannot be done perfectly. And that happens often. Why we call it search error? Because argmin, you can think of it at least conceptually as a search in the space of all possible parameters or all possible solutions. At some point, you are doing something that's 
at least implicitly, searching a large space of possibilities, and often you're doing it heuristically. Now, if you do it with something like dynamic programming, that's not a heuristic. Dynamic programming often gives you a guaranteed optimal solution. But whenever you use a heuristic solution, a greedy solution, um, an approximate you know, way of going about things, then you may not end up with the best value of the parameters, or even if you have the best value of the parameters, when you do your inference, you might do it approximately and not have the best answer. So another important source of error is search error, the fact that you couldn't optimize things completely. Yeah? So would you ever have a modeling error of zero and a search error, which is positive? I think so. Uh, I think I can create something like that. So modeling error of zero would be if somebody gave me the model, OK? Um, so we can think of a model that is known to me, and, but the search space is huge. So let's say I'm trying to solve some NP-complete problem, find the maximal click size, click you know, size in a very, very large graph, and I use a variety of heuristics, and let's say there's some prior distribution over graphs, a prior distribution over, I don't know, something. Maybe it's not good because I need something with a distribution over it. But suddenly, if you, if you are, here, here's the situation. I think the NP-completeness is a good one. The, the, the essence of an NP-complete problem or NP-hard problem is that it's hard to find the optimal solution, but once you found it, you can, you can verify that it's optimal, right? So um, the only kind of error you have there is a search error. In the speech recognition, very often we do some analysis of the errors, and every, every mistake that is made by the recognizer, we ask ourselves, is it a modeling error? You know, we just got that sound wrong in our description. Is it a search error? And if we search more exhaustively, we will find the correct solution. Or is it an inevitable base error? It's not easy to decide which one it is. Search error is actually very easy to decide. The way you find out if something was a search error is you compare the score of the best solution you found with the score of the correct solution. And if your model scores the correct solution better, then you know it would have chosen it if it had found it. And that's a classic search error. It just didn't get to it. It didn't see it. So there's nothing wrong with your model. It, it just wasn't able to, to, uh, to find it, to go over all the possibilities. But the modeling error and base error are hard to tell apart because you don't know the truth. Of course, if you do know the truth as an experiment, then, then you can. But in the real world, when you don't know the truth, you don't know if it's a base error or a modeling error. When the entropy can be zero? When what? When the entropy can be zero? When the entropy can be zero? No, uh, perfectly yeah. So perfectly separable classes is an example of a base error being zero. Now, if you're trying to uh, convert it to a language of the entropy, I would say that the entropy of the label conditioned on the input is zero. OK, um, let me move to another topic, and that is reinforcement learning. There were two or three topics that used to be hot in the past, and then they kind of died. And reinforcement learning didn't die, but it certainly took a long nap and uh, uh, kind of slowed down uh, from the 90s until about five years ago. And then it woke up again. And that's, that's great. That means that we shouldn't discount things that look hopeless because one day they may not be hopeless. The other topics, by the way, are genetic uh, search and genetic learning, uh, which is still kind of half asleep. Um, but let's talk about reinforcement learning. It's a setting, it's a very different kind of setting than what we've had until now. Reinforcement learning deals with a situation where you're trying to learn optimal behavior under very difficult conditions. Um, you, know, you don't get the right feedback right away. You might get some feedback, but it's not the full feedback. So a classic example would be chess. In chess, you have to make a choice at every state what move to make. And 
you make that choice multiple times. Along the way, you may get some material, you know, capture some pieces, and you may lose some pieces. So you get some feedback, but it's not a very good feedback because ultimately what matters is if you win or lose the game. And you do get that, that message at the end, but you only get it at the end. And when you get that message, whether you won or lost, nobody tells you how that related to the decision you made before. Was the move that you made at move 12 is the one that's responsible for you losing? Or is it you know, the move that you made later? Maybe you played brilliantly all the way, but then you made one stupid move and lost, or the other way around. So the dependence of the final outcome on the steps you took along the way is very complicated. Here's another example. You are searching for a prize, or there's a variety of prizes, like Pac-Man. Anybody played Pac-Man here? Okay, so you have a variety of uh, you know, cherries and dots and whatever, um, and you have to make a decision, go this way, that way, and you collect some prizes, but how many prizes you collect later depends on the decisions you make now, and ultimately you're judged by the total prizes that you collected along the way. So how do you learn what's good policy, a good way of behaving, good rules for how to behave in different situations, when the feedback is distributed along the way or maybe even delayed all the way to far away in the future. That's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, a related characteristic of these situations is that once you decided on an action, you find yourself in a new state and that state is not necessarily your choice. Um, I made a move in chess and now the person on the other side is making a move and now I'm in a state that I didn't choose. Um, if you are a Pokemon, but you're playing in a dungeon and you don't know, you decide to open a door over here, um, you find yourself in that room. Maybe there's a way back, maybe there's no way back, okay? The steps, you know, actions have consequences. The steps you make change your state. So you need to kind of, in a ideal situation, to kind of map out how your actions result in states, but also how they result in rewards. So these are the three important things, states, actions, and rewards. And this is how we usually envision um, this um, reinforcement learning paradigm. There's you and there's the world. Now, Tom Mitchell calls this the agent and this the environment, but I think this is a lot nicer. You and the world. You are in a certain state say it as, and you have to make a decision based on the state, and decision is some kind of action. Action A, state S, and then the world, influenced by your action, does two things. It puts you in a different state, and it possibly gives you some reward. So there are two arrows going this way. A new state, call it S prime, and a reward, call it R. Now, there are lots of variations on this. First of all, what is the state, what is the space of all states, the state space? Is it finite? Is it continuous or discrete? You know, are you moving in a two-dimensional continuous space? Is it infinite or not? Uh, the simplest thing to think about is a finite set of states. How are they connected? Can you move from every state to every other state? Then there is, um, so this is the state space. It could be continuous, discrete, finite, bounded, not bounded, anything. Then uh, the reward. Are you going to count equally all the, the rewards you get. One might think, yes, if you get dollars, you get them now and you get the next step, the next step, at the end you care about how many dollars you got all together. But there are a couple of complications. One of them is, first of all, there's inflation in the world. And if it, you play for a while, the dollars you earned earlier are worth more than the dollars you earn later because you know, there's been inflation. A second reason is that uh, a more pragmatic one, you have more uncertainty about what will happen in the future. You prefer to have a couple dollars in your hands now, early on, before you know, things happen. So in terms of risk, 
Um, economists would tell you that dollars now are worth more to people than dollar in the future, the, the promise of dollars in the future. There's also a pragmatic uh, consideration of optimization. Um, if you um, value a dollar that you'll get a year from now the same as a dollar you get today, then to be consistent, you should value a dollar you get two years from now the same as last year, the same as now, and three years from now, and four years from now, which means that somebody can keep promising you money in the future and never deliver. And you will just keep going that way because you think you're accumulating great promises, but the promises are like in the, in the in infinite future. So for all of these reasons, usually what we're trying to maximize is not the sum of the rewards, but the um, depreciated sum of the rewards. So the, what we're trying to optimize is usually sum of the rewards, Ri, but raise the reward to some power like 0. Point, um, how do we do that? Uh, da, 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 da. So I depends, so I goes, let's call it first of all T, this is time. And time, when it's bigger, it is in the future, it is worth less. And therefore, it would be to the power of t, 0 0.9 times t. So for rewards that are further in the future, they're multiplied by a larger, by a smaller number here. Should be like this. I remember the exact formula. But basically, you. Um, you, one way you can implement it is every time step you discount all the money, um, all the money that you have. No, you discount the future. The future is being discounted. So let me look at the book. What formula it uses? Yeah, it's not raised to the power; it's just multiplied by. So this is the reward you get in the first step, and then you get 90%, you, you weigh the reward you get in the second step by 90%, and then you get the reward you get in the, third, in the next step after that by 90 squared and so forth. So this is a geometric series which will converge to a finite, finite amount. So this will be sum of um, 0 0.9 to the t times RT. T goes from zero to infinity. So what you're trying to optimize is the weighted or depreciated, I don't know if depreciation is the right word here, but discounted is the word that's being used. The infinite sum of the discounted rewards from here to eternity. Because it's a geometric series and it converges, you can afford to go all the way to infinity. You don't need to say, I'll stop the game after 10 steps. So that's as far as rewards. Then there are other variations. So there will be a function that takes your current state and the action you chose and places you in a new state. And there would be another function that takes the current state and the action you chose and decides on the reward you get in that state, R. Okay, two functions, a transition function and a reward function. Each one of these two functions independently could be deterministic or could be uh, stochastic. Same state, same action, sometimes can lead to one following action, uh, state and f sometimes leads to uh, a different one or a different reward. So each one of them separately could be either deterministic or stochastic. Each one of them separately could be either known to you or not known to you. Even if they're both fully known to you and deterministic, it's still a difficult question to decide what's an optimal policy. <coughs> okay? So let me say, let me write it for both of these. Each one of them could be deterministic or stochastic. And known or not. Of course, the easiest situation is when it's known and it's deterministic. And let's suppose both of them are both known and deterministic. 
still learning the best action in every step is difficult. How do you uh, define what you have to learn? We call it a policy. Policy is a mapping from state to action. Impl implied in this is that the optimal action depends only on the state you're in. This is the mark of first order Markov assumption. You can definitely imagine games where it's not true, where it depends on something else too. But under this formulation, where the functions that determine the next step and that determine the reward depend only on the state and the action, then usually there would be an optimal policy that takes as input the states and decides what the optimal action is. The way we derive this optimal policy uh, is where it gets interesting. Uh, we call the optimal policy pi star, and we try to de derive, to estimate a function called the Q function. I don't know why it's called the Q function, but it's called throughout reinforcement learning, it's called the Q function. So learning that function is called Q learning. The Q function is a function of a state and a contemplated action. And it basically tries to capture the value of being in that state and taking that action. Specifically, the optimal value, the value, the, the value from here on to infinity of all the rewards you get, you're gonna get, properly discounted, um, assuming you're gonna make optimal decisions from here on. So the Q function is a value of being at state i, at state s, and taking action a, then continuing optimally, continuing optimally, optimally from then on for the rest of eternity. If you somehow learned the Q function, now you have an optimal, a way of driving optimal decisions all the time. It's very, very simple. If we had Q, the right Q function, then optimal A, optimal um, um, action to take as a function of S, is to consider the value of um, Q for S and A prime are uh, not summed, maximized. Um, argmax, thank you. Argmax over all steps A, A prime, of the value that you will get after you take the step, but don't forget you get a reward um, if, from uh, having started from step S and taking step A. Um, sorry, let me redo that a little bit. This is not what I mean. You're in state S. You're considering a variety of, of activities A, A prime, A prime. One, two, three. Each one of them gives you some reward and puts you in some new state, S prime. And when you consider your three options, for each one you should add together the reward you get, if you take it, and the value of being in this state. So let me start with that. This is the value Q of being not in state S, but in the successor state S, the state that you get to if you started in A, you took A prime. So this is the state you end up in. This is the reward you're gonna get if you start with state A and took action A prime. So this is, sorry, this is the total value of choosing to take action A prime. You get this reward, and then you get to be in, in the successor state, whatever its value is. No, 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 I got that right, wrong again. 
It's what happens when you don't review material before the course. Um, Q, Q has to have a action. Right. Um, max. Max over A prime. This is the value of the successor state. Right? Optimal decision based on state S is the one that over all possible actions maximizes the reward that I get from being in state S and taking step A, taking action A, plus the discounted value, gamma is the 0 0.9, the discounting factor. It doesn't have to be 0 0.9, some discounting factor of the value. That's why I didn't, I try to cut corners. I didn't define for you the value function. The optimal value of the successor state to S, S and A. And the optimal value of any state is the R max over all A prime of Q S A prime. So if you just take this thing and replace it with this thing, I hope it's clearer now. The value, the optimal step to take when you're in state S is the one step, the one action that maximizes this. And what is this? This is the reward you get from that action. And this is the discount ver discounted version of the value of being in a new state. And the value of the optimal value of being in a new state is the value that you can get by taking the optimal action in that state. Is that a max instead of an R max? This is a max. Thank you. The point is that if you know the Q function, you can take rational actions that are provably optimal with regard to the setup you created. Um, there's one problem here. You have to do a bit of simulation in your head. When you're sitting in state S and you're considering all your options, you have to do the calculation of what reward will I get if I take this action and what state will I be in? And that goes to the question of is it the deterministic or stochastic function, both the R function and the next state function? Are they the, first of all, are they known to you or not? And are they deterministic or stochastic? If they're not known to you, the only thing you can do is try. And you can't try all of them. You can try just one of them. So even if you know the Q function, you still are not sure what the optimal uh, step is. You just have to take a step. And well, if you know the Q function, no, you still, you still need to know these. So one way of learning and of making decisions is by trial and error. If you don't know the Q function, you're just learning it. That's even worse because you have to, typically what you do is you start with some kind of a, a, a very crude approximation of the Q function, a very, a very simple, like maybe everything is zero. And then you incrementally update the Q function. You learn different values of it by trying different things, seeing what kind of reward you get and have an update rule. This is an excruciatingly slow way to learn. If your state space is 10 by 10, so 100 states, 100 states, and if in every state you have five actions, then the Q function, state and action, has 500 values. They're not probabilities, they're just values. And every time you take a step, you're updating just one of them. Updating, not, not getting it right, just increasing its accuracy somewhat. 
And there are proofs that if you visit all the states and take all the actions infinitely often, namely infinitely many times, you will eventually converge to the right answer. But that, that proof was worth nothing practically because anything beyond two or three states did not, there was not enough time to converge. So that was the state of reinforcement learning until five years ago. What happened five years ago is that people started to apply, sorry, deep learning to, um, to learn the Q function. And for some types of Q functions, it worked very, very well. There's a paper out of Google um, of learning to play video games. That was kind of a big kind of revolution. If you think about video games, um, the number of states is potentially very large. In fact, you can think of it as continuous, but the number of actions is very simple, right? It's designed for people. People are simple things. They just move things right or left, push a button. So really, you have you know, right, left, up, down, and push a button. Five actions. And then uh, you can make some assumptions about uh, continuity of that function, of the Q function. So the Q function is a function of a state space, which is large and continuous, and of a d five discrete steps. Move this way, that way, up, down, and push a button. Um, and then you can um, learn it, not the slow way of every different separate thing to learn using multiple training examples, but tie them all together. And you do that through a, basically a neural network. The input to the neural network is a state, and the output, um, the input is a state, and either the output is an action or the, there's an additional representation of the actions, and then you get some values, I don't know which I think they tried it both ways. But that turned out to work exceedingly well for a large number of, um, of video games. Question? No? Okay. Yeah? The might, no, the rewards may very well be zero. So in chess, the reward is zero. If you get checkmated, it doesn't matter how many pieces you took, right? It, it's immaterial. So at some state, you get the rewards, but at the, like the rest of other states, you don't. That's a very good point. Suppose you have a game or a state of the world where all the rewards are at the end. How can you learn in such a world? And the answer is you learn backwards. What, me what it means is that you first learn what it means to be near a winning state. So let's take chess as an example. You have no idea if the only feedback you get is you won or you lost or, or a draw, then you really originally don't get any feedback about any individual move. But you do get feedback about your last move, the one before you got checkmated. In fact, the position just before you got checkmated, you learn has a terrible value. And the next thing you learn is stay away from that position, so don't be in positions that lead to that position. And then you learn backwards. It's, it's very slow kind of learning, but you first learn the end state, the winner or loser, and then the next to end state, and then the next to next to end state, and you can prove theoretically that eventually you will converge to the right values all the way, but that eventually could be exponentially far away. It helps when there are, when there's feedback. In fact, it can help exponentially if you get feedback early. We know that from human learning, by the way, that we are not so good at learning things whose consequences are far away, like when we grow up and go to college and whatever, that uh, the, the, the connection doesn't exist. But the candy that you're going to get right now, that's a good, uh, I mean, we're built that way, and we are very shrewd at applying discounting factor to future rewards, right? Because who knows if the candy will be there tomorrow, your brother will take it. So, 